level up your hunting game and join the cause. Help preserve small town Texas hunting culture and become a more successful hunter by learning the best ways to squeeze the most out of your budget and precious time out in the field. Welcome to the Feed Bandit Podcast. Here are your resident bandits, Richard Kinchlow and Jimmy Burke. Hi folks, welcome back to the Feet Bandit Podcast. Jimmy here. Uh, you know, now that we're getting uh, closer to deer season, we figured it was a good opportunity to, you know, start uh, studying up, uh, refreshing our memories, refreshing our skills uh, about all things deer hunting. So we're going to start a little series here talking about the things that can uh, help us be uh, not only more successful out in the field while we're hunting, but also, you know, the things that can help us after we uh, take that animal. Um, so I wanted to start this series off uh, by reading some excerpts from a book, a very interesting book, called The Hunter's Haunch. Uh, the subtitle to that is, uh, What You Don't Know About Deer and Venison That Will Change the Way You Cook. So obviously, other than getting that trophy on your wall, a big part of what you do when you go hunting is you, you want to keep that meat can be absolutely amazing, you know, depending on how good of a cook you are or how good of a processor you take it to. Uh, but it also can be quite disappointing if, uh, one, if you don't have experience in cooking or uh, if you just kind of screw it up along the way, because it can be kind of a fickle thing. So I kind of wanted to, in this episode, uh, lay the groundwork for uh, this discussion that we'll kind of we'll talk about, you know, over the over the coming deer season, all about uh Tips, tricks, things about that, about uh, how you can uh, uh, take care of, prepare, and enjoy the meat that you work so hard at, uh, you know, when you're out in the field. You do all that work all year long to, um, you know, to ensure that you'll have success. You'll be able to harvest that deer or more more than one deer uh, if you're lucky enough. And, uh, you know... You don't want to go through all that work and, and things uh, go go bad on the meat side. So uh, let's jump in it. Is venison safe to eat? Why does it taste gamey? What can be done to make venison better? For as long as humans have been eating venison, which is a very long time indeed, these questions have been asked and answered in a bewildering number of ways. There are a few reasons why the answers are so inconsistent but it starts with the fact that people haven't always been talking about the same thing. Prior to the industrial age, venison referred to the meat of any traditional game animals taken by hunting. In Europe and England, traditional game animals were chiefly members of the Cervidae family, a group that still includes deer, but also elk, caribou, moose, and reindeer, as well as bears and wild pigs. Let me just uh, pause here. Servid, servidae, you know, depends on how you uh, pronounce it. Always had trouble with that word. Don't hold it against me. The, the term venison existed in opposition to cattle, which referred to livestock mammals in general, like cows, sheep, goats, and pigs. In other words, venison did not necessarily come from a deer, moose, or any other servant. To be venison had to meet two criteria. One, it had to come from a traditional game animal living in the wild. And two, it had to be taken by hunting and not by snaring, trapping, or some other means. Today's consumers prefer not to not or not to think about the animal's life or the means of its taking. Instead, the animal has one name and its meat has another. So cows become beef, calves become veal, pigs become pork, sheep become mutton, and deer become venison. It makes no sense to say that pork comes from a cow, or that mutton comes from a pig. There is a logic to the pattern, and that logic affirms, if X animal, then Y meat. If deer, then venison. The deer no longer has to be wild, and it does not have to be hunted for its meat to be called venison. That's interesting. Did not know the history behind the terms of it, term venison or cattle. There are two kinds of Deer venison, venison that is wild, and venison that is farmed. The farmed kind, which is sold in stores, is becoming more widely available to middle-class consumers. The wild version is now generally lower in culinary status because it's perceived to be gamey and possibly quote-unquote unsafe. 
This perception is nearly unique to the United States. Everywhere else, wild venison is coveted as a culinary delicacy. In part, this is because the United States is the only country where hunting wasn't historically restricted to the nobility or to the landed gentry. During the Depression, game meat became sustenance for the impoverished, and anecdotal stories still abound of deer being poached to feed the family. Eight decades later, it is still largely coded as meat for the poor, even as it has been gaining popularity among middle-class locavores and slow food advocates as an organic, nutrient-rich, additive-free meat. For a small group at the very highest end of the economic spectrum, the opportunity to simply to, op, opportunity to sample true game meat is a sought-after gastronomic experience. Well, let me pause there. I thought that was pretty interesting. It says uh, they make the claim that it's still largely coded as meat for the poor, even though it's been gaining popularity at, uh, as organic, nutrient-rich, additive meat, additive-free meat, which I find kind of ironic. I just have to point out here that you know the the hypothetical, typical, I guess, uh, organic, uh, you know, nutrient-free, additive-free uh, person. Uh, not so much anymore, but used to always be kind of that same person who seemed like they were against hunting and against, uh, you know, any, any, any of the things that we hunters, you know, like to do. Yet they couldn't understand that, hey, you know, we're taking the same kind of meat products that you advocate eating or if you're still a carnivore, uh, you know, it doesn't have all the garbage that's put in the food. So you should be a pro hunting advocate. I think that's kind of going to, I mean, it's. The trend is going away from that. I'm sure there's a lot of that still. But anyway, I thought that's kind of an interesting uh, dichotomy, I guess, in thinking or you know, conflict, conflict in thinking amongst those people. Anyway, I'll continue. It's certainly true that venison can be gained to the point of inedibility. It can also be delicious. But it's precisely this unpredictability that distinguishes wild from farmed venison. Wild deer are highly varied in size and habitat, and each species requires different approaches in the kitchen. In the United States, the kinds of deer that can be legally hunted include the robust American whitetail, the blacktail, and the mule deer. In the United Kingdom, quote, deer, unquote, can refer to the small roe deer, the majestic red deer, the fallow deer, the psyche deer, the Chinese water deer, and the munt jack, a miniature deer that regularly appears on lists of the world's strangest animals because it has fangs and barks like a dog. The red deer is the largest and most prestigious quarry, with the fallow deer a close second. There are more kinds of deer than these nine, but they are among the most common species and subspecies that can be legally hunted in Europe, the United Kingdom, and the United States. To be successful, game cooks must start by identifying the precise deer they're handling. For example, the pale and delicate venison of the roe deer requires swift cooking and light sauces compared to the red deer. To handle roe deer as if it is red deer will result in dry and rubbery venison. However, the red deer is the more traditional quarry in Europe and the United Kingdom, making, making it what the old world culinary imagination casts as real venison. Much in the same way in the United States, quote unquote, real venison defaults to whitetail. Thus, when Walt Disney made the animated American film Bambi in 1942, the title character was a whitetail deer. However, in the original European novel Bambi, 1923, the title character was a red deer. Disney made the change in order to avoid confusing American viewers, because there are no red deer in the United States. To American eyes, the red deer looked like a mutant. It was literally an alien species. Very interesting. Did not know that. At the time... Knowing the difference between a whitetail and a red deer was common knowledge, as there were many more hunters and cooks that would have prepared venison regularly. But matters changed quickly. Following the end of the Second World War, an extended period of prosperity meant that consumers no longer needed to know how to grow, how to grow fish and hunt for food, let alone how to cook game meat so it tasted good. Several decades later, only 6% of the American population still hunts meaning that 94% of the general public has forgotten how to discern differences among deer species, which mush together into one big-eyed, black-nosed, long-legged symptom of nature's bounty. Bambi's metamorphosis, metamorphosis 
I don't have a tongue tied there. From red deer into white deer is just one example of a largely unnoticed cultural shift changing how we view wildlife. In this case, a new generation of diners is amazed by the fact that European aristocrats and American settlers used to choke down venison every night for supper. Was venison better in the good old days, or have palates changed? Consider the whitetail. Because it's geographically widespread across the North American continent, and also easy to identify, the whitetail has become the iconic symbol of American wildlife. Like all members of the Cervidae family, the white-tailed deer, let's see if I can pronounce this, Autocoileus, Autocoileus virginianus, is a hooved herbivore. A male whitetail is a buck, a female is a doe, a juvenile is a fawn. Though it can graze head down, it prefers to browse for food head up, favoring berries, leafy bushes, and tree buds. Large-bodied with slim legs, the adult whitetail ranges in size from 90-pound does to 300-pound bucks. Its pelt is brown with a white belly, and its most distinctive characteristic is the white underside of its tail, which it raises like a, like a warning flag to alert other members of the herd. Fawns are reddish-brown and spotted. Mature bucks have prolonged antlers, which they drop every year following the mating season, called the rut. In the United States, the whitetail is so ubiquitous that books about deer hunting typically lay out the best strategies for hunting in this particular species. The whitetail is the ongoing focus of the large and well-organized Quality Deer Management Association, which provides an annual report on the state of the species. Over the past few decades, wildlife biologists have closely studied the biology, habitat, mating patterns, population numbers, diseases, and behaviors of white-tailed deer. This information grows daily because deer hunting generates large revenues for the tourist industry, along with commercial sales of outdoor gear and sporting equipment, of which we hope uh, all you listeners out there take a gander at our gear page over at feedbandit.com. Uh, that's where we post uh, some of the great uh, stuff that some of the folks we've talked to on the podcast are making, some of these small small businesses uh, going out there and improving on some of the some of the, the gear that you know and love and uh, really making it special. So check that out, feedbanda.com slash gear. The 2012 National Survey of Fishing, Hunting, and Wildlife Associated Recreation, issued by the United States Department of Fish and Wildlife Service, estimated that 13.7 million people, or 6% of the adult population in the United States, went hunting in 2011. Of this group of hunters, 11.6 million individuals, or 85%, pursued large game such as elk and deer. An additional 33 million people went fishing. 6% doesn't sound like a lot, but the United States is a big country. By any other measure, 11.6 million hunters is a large number of enthusiasts, especially given that they are mostly interested in a single species, white-tailed deer. Currently, there are over 4 million white-tail in Texas alone, and an estimated 30 million in the country. A legal hunter gets one tag per deer, but of course, getting a tag is not a guarantee of a kill. Of course, your tags and whatnot vary by where you are, as we all know. 11.6 million hunters does not automatically translate into 11.6 million deer heads mounted on walls. Far from it, as we all know. <laughs> Ironically, hunting has less of an impact on the deer populations than the high rate of vehicular collisions which is now responsible for the majority of deer fatalities in the country. That I did not know. Very interesting. I, no, I can count myself amongst one of the uh, unlucky or lucky uh, drivers that have uh, caused one of those fatalities in the, in the past. Or Christy. Hunters would like it very much if American drivers would stop running into deer, and it makes the challenging task of hunting even more difficult. Until you go looking for them, whitetails seem to be everywhere. Then they're invisible. Ain't that the truth? Even in today's fame-obsessed world, white-tailed deer don't stand around posing for the paparazzi. They look like a furry blur, a flap of a warning tail, or a wet and curious nose. Because deer spend a lot of time making sure you can't see them, researchers have consistently updated best hunting practices with the latest scientific information. The same updating, however, has not held true regarding the treatment of the venison. 
Instead, venison has long been framed as an afterthought or byproduct of the hunt, and either consumed out of obligation or discarded because it's in such bad shape that it's not worth the effort to salvage. So that last point there, it's in such bad shape, not, it's not worth the effort. We'll be talking a lot about that on future future podcasts and as I go through this uh, little study here with you. So uh, stay tuned there, definitely. To remedy this situation, the hunter's haunch investigates the impact of history, hunting traditions, cooking habits, and folk- folklore on the preparation of wild venison, thereby positioning ven- venison as a component of the hunt itself. Because culinary interest in wild game is relatively recent, serious attention has not yet been paid to the impact of hunting practices on the quality of the venison. Instead, one of the few stabs at synthesizing the killing, cooking, and consumption of a wild animal is a famous essay by novelist David Foster Wallace, Consider the Lobster, in 2005, is a strange essay made even more strange for the fact that Gourmet published it. Wallace's struggles to grapple with the idea of preparing lobster, which is just about the only wild animal that American housewives will admit to killing with their own two hands, demonstrate just how little today's consumers understand regarding the relationship of animal life to the food on their plates. Wallace observed, A detail so obvious that most recipes don't even bother to mention it is that each lobster is supposed to be alive when you put it in the kettle. This is part of lobster's modern appeal. It's the freshest food there is. There's no decomposition between harvesting and eating. Well, he's correct. Lobster recipes tend to leave this information out. If you ask the fishmonger, he will tell you what to do with them, but he will think you're either an idiot or a foreigner (laughs) for not already knowing how to cook them. Albeit in a very odd way, Wallace also points out that cooks who try to dispatch the lobster more, quote, humanely by microwaving stabbing or slowly raising the temperature of the lobster instead of dropping it in boiling water, are not only performing conceptual somersaults around the lobster's basic anatomy, but deluding themselves regarding the human capacity for moral relevancy. It's also the case that Wallace didn't catch the lobster. He mostly stared at it. Perhaps if he had put in the weeks of work to obtain the lobster himself, he might have felt differently about things. In the end, despite his ethical qualms, Wallace ate the lobster anyway. But like Henry David Thoreau before him, he felt elaborately, exhaustively bad about it. As with the lobster, part of venison's modern appeal is that it's fresh, wild, and replete with nostalgic value. It's got a certain culinary cachet, tastes better with butter, and the wild version is becoming increasingly inaccessible at all social levels. As that inaccessibility increases, so do the myths in forming its preparation. Lobsters, lobsters turn red when boiled, and venison dries out when roasted. This, quote, obvious information gets left out of re- recipes, leaving gaps that only become problems when common knowledge isn't so common anymore. The older the recipe, the larger the blank spaces. With each successive generation, the reasons behind certain conventions have become obscured or totally lost. One of the goals of the hunter's haunch is to re-examine those inherited practices. Why did they work a hundred years ago? Do they still work today? Good question. Knowing what we do today, how can we adapt that passed down knowledge to our culinary advantage? To recap, venison, quote, unquote, used to include the meat of any game animal taken by hunting. Quote, venison now chiefly refers to meat from deer. Now chiefly refers to meat from deer, including farm deer. In the American context, Quote, deer means whitetail. In the British and European context, quote, deer means red deer. Even within these same species, however, the taste, toughness, and texture of venison can vary so widely that many cooks wonder how it's possible that it never seems to behave the same way twice. It's because the flavor, tenderness, and palatability of wild venison depends on, one, the deer's diet, two, the time of year it was taken, three, the geographic geographical region where it was living, four, the age of the animal, five, the sex of the animal, six, its overall health, seven, if female, whether it was pregnant, eight, whether it was hunted well or badly, nine, if it was, hunt- if it was correctly field-dressed, and finally ten, if it was hung and for how long. The first seven variables depend on the wildness of the wild animal. 
The last three reflect the care and skill of the hunter. None of these factors involve cooking. Even when the hunter is the cook, it's, it is only after the carcass enters the kitchen that culinary skills impact the quality of the dish. In other words, wild meat is the record of a good hunt, along with everything that entails. Delicious venison starts all the way back with the decision to hunt in order to put food on the table. A decision that changes strategy, timing, setup, even weapon and ammo. If your venison is inedible, consider these common errors. 1. Aiming with the ego. The best eating is not the aggressive trophy buck with the biggest rack. The best eating is calm and young, which means a pronghorn buck or, an, or a doe. I agree with that. I'll take those. Uh, <laughs> I'll take those spikes any day of the week. Two, making a bad shot. If you bungle your shot and the deer starts to run, it spells disaster for your supper. Something to think about. You know, I, you know, eight times out of ten, you know, I'll drop a, a deer right there. But, you know, on occasion, it does run a little bit. And I mean, maybe you try to do a little experiment, keeping that meat a little separate and see if it, you know, if it does taste a little different. Three, poor field dressing. Bring field dressing tools and a tarp and know how to proceed before starting a hunt. Four, careless butchering. Books have scent glands. They smell bad and taste worse. Don't let it get on the meat or your hands. Five, ignoring biology. A carcass wants to be cooled as fast as it can. Neglect this step at your digestive peril. Uh, just to point on this, we totally agree. Um, one interesting podcast we did in the in the past, way back episode twenty one, was uh, with Steve Glass. He's the inventor of cooler gel and the trophy bag cooler. So, cooler gel is this gel he invented that uh, prolongs the lifetime of your ice. That really works. I use it all the time. Uh, you put it in your cool, you freeze it, you put it in your cooler and man, even if you have a Yeti and you know, your ice could stay a long time with a Yeti or, or really the other product that we want that I want to let you guys know about that we've talked to, uh, let's say is a uh, bison coolers. So, you know, they, they're a, a better alternative, a competitor to Yetis. Um, they're doing really some more cool things over, over there at bisoncoolers.com. Um, you know, check them out. Uh, you want to have a good cooler to put your meat in, and then you can prolong or keep, get that meat as cold as possible, as fast as possible with a, a cooler cube or a cooler, cooler gel. Um, so you can combine those two things to really preserve your meat. Uh, episode 21, listen to that. That's on the cooler gel and the trophy bag cooler. So there's a bag where you put your old carcass in with the cooler gel to keep it cold. Or you can go and listen to episode 42, where we talked to Jeremy Dennison, the owner of Bison Coolers, talking about what, uh, you know, where he's coming from, what they're trying to produce over there. So two good episodes to listen to. Uh, number six, not planning for bad weather. Too warm or too cold for hanging damages the venison. Shift the carcass to a meat locker, if possible. Seven, leaving the cuts untrimmed. Fat goes rancid. Trimming knives are your friend. And finally, eight, confusing venison with beef. How it looks raw is and how it cooks up. Know the cut. That's very important. Again, out of these eight errors, only the last one has anything to do with cooking techniques. Surprisingly, the recipe itself is the least important factor in determining the deliciousness of the dish. If the venison starts out in good shape, the cook's main job is to make sure not to ruin it. Terrific venison only needs a hot pan, a bit of oil, sea salt, and cracked pepper to be exceptional in taste and texture. But if the deer is badly hunted, it won't matter if the chief, uh, if the chef's the chief, it won't matter if the chef smothers it in sautéed truffles with a side of honey glazed squash flowers. It will be terrible. I can attest to that. <laughs> the hunter's haunch hopes to help hunters avoid this tragedy by explaining why and how it happens in the first place. So there it is, folks. That's kind of the introduction to the, this series where we're going to talk about uh, you know, hunting the deer, uh, processing it properly, uh, preparing the meat, or pre preparing the meat maybe even for transport, but also for storage, and then talk about how, how we're going to cook it and whatnot. We're going to do this all deer season. So it's going to be fun. Um, you know, part of, uh, a big part of what we do here at Feed Bandit, uh, just as a reminder, is, you know, we really pa we're really passionate about 
uh, supporting and promoting and supporting, you know, the small town Texas hunting culture. So, you know, remember, you know, as you're thinking about, you know, how you're going to handle your meat and whatnot, uh, think about, you know, maybe the tools that you'll need in order to do that. Um, and also think about, you know, if you're not going to prepare the meat yourself, if you're going to take it to a processor, you know, think about where you're going to take it. You're going to take it to, uh, you know, if there's one by your, your, your place where you're hunting, try them out, you know, see how, see how, uh, how they do, how their, how their meat uh, comes out. Um, also, you know, uh, if there's, uh, some tools you need after we get through this, you're thinking, you know, I do need a better knife. I need a better, uh, way to hang the animal. I need, you know, some, some equipment, some gear or whatnot. Uh, consider checking out your local feed store. They supply all a lot of this gear for you, and uh, be sure to patronize them. Keep that help them stay in business, especially now. It's so very important to uh, patronize the stores, the shops, the the uh, feed stores, etc., and in uh, these small towns around where we hunt because we need them there. In, you know, for later on, you know, to help us out while we're out in the field. So be sure to do that. And uh, I guess the last thing is, or second to last thing, uh, please let us know about how your hunting season's going so far. You know, we're, we're in the middle of deer season, some teal is going on. Uh, please let us know how it's going. You know, you can go to feedbandit.com. You can either uh, shoot us an email at howdy at feedbandit.com or record a voicemail. You can do that directly on the webpage. Uh, if you got any questions, any subjects, or anything you want us to address, we'd love to throw out our opinion on it. So shoot us a voicemail. It's really easy. You can do it directly through your phone or, or obviously, or, you know, your browser on your phone or the website on your computer, right through that microphone. So, uh, please go there, do that. Uh, obviously give us a review if you like what we're doing. If, if you believe in the same, uh, cause that we, we have here, like we say, support, supporting your local feed store, supporting your small town hunting culture. Uh, small town, especially small town Texas hunting culture. We emphasize Texas only because we both are here and we hunt here and we love this state, but we know that we have other listeners out there that are in other states. Um, you know, so support your, your local small towns around where you hunt, support those businesses. It's, uh, so vitally important. So if you're listening, you're not on their email list yet, go to feedbanded.com, get on our email list, go there. We'll, you know, you'll join, join the cause, help us do what we can to uh, support that culture, that small town hunting culture. So with that, I just want to thank everyone for listening as always. Uh, thank our new listeners for coming on board. Uh, we hope you stick around and keep listening. I thank our existing listeners so much. We really appreciate it. Just want to wish everyone a uh, continuing success during hunting season. And we'll see you on the next episode of the Feed Bandit Podcast. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Feed Bandit Podcast. If you like what we discuss on the show, be sure to sign up to our email list to get even more killer hunting ideas, tips, tricks, and exclusive deals on innovative hunting gear and services delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up over at FeedBandit.com or simply by texting the word BANDIT to 33777. See you on the next one. And remember, support your local feed store.